Welcome to the Man Amongst Men podcast. Live a life of intentionality, adventure, and brotherhood. Take the inner journey and live out over your edge constantly. Here are your hosts, Dominic and Brian. Dr. David Lay is the clinical psychologist that I wish that I had access to when I was going through my four years of Sex Addicts Anonymous recovery. And he's a man that I wish that every man had access to for questions about sexual desire and insecurities and behaviors, which is why we are bringing him to you on the Man Amongst Men podcast. Now, I had a chance to witness Dr. David Lay speak for my first time in person at Esther Perel's Paradox of Masculinity Conference here in New York City. And some of the things that he took the stage with, I had never heard anyone speak openly about before, even after years of being in behind the scenes and doing deep work on matters of my own sexuality. For example, he's a multiple time author and quite provocative about some of the topics he writes about. His first book was Insatiable Wives, Women Who Stray and the Men Who Love Them. His second book, which is one that I recommend every man read who watches pornography, it's called Ethical Porn for Dicks, A Man's Guide to Responsible Viewing Pleasure. And this last book around the myth of sex addiction was one that piqued Esther Perel's interest. She said it's one of the most influential books in her understanding of men's sexual behavior. And Dr. David Lay is quite outspoken, one of the very few, about the belief that sex addiction isn't actually a thing. It's a myth. And in our conversation, you'll hear him talk about how if sex addiction were an actual thing, that it would be cross-cultural, meaning there would be evidence of this in other cultures across the world. And we're not seeing that. It's primarily a phenomenon that we label here in the Western world. And what Dr. David Lay says that's really going on is that these erratic behaviors, these compulsive behaviors are born from guilt and shame on the difference between the sexual desires that we have, this kind of sex that we want to be having, and what we have been taught is morally okay. Regardless of where you are on the sexual spectrum, I'm pretty sure that everyone can relate to feelings of that, the guilt and shame around a desire that you have and what you have been taught is okay. And so we get into a discussion of that today. And we cover a lot of ground in some places that uh, that, that are really exciting for any of you men listening here uh, to deepen your idea and understanding of the forces that drive your sexual behavior, like Dr. David Lay challenging the idea of sex addiction, like why normal men, healthy men, quote unquote labeled, should be thinking about their sexuality, especially when they're not having sex, the game of Russian roulette around how to tell your partner about your porn habits and to involve her in that conversation in a safe and healthy and mutually beneficial way. Why people are kinkier than you might think, quite a bit more so, and why that's good news for you in helping get some of your sexual desires and needs met and reducing any guilt or shame around that while also doing the same for your partner. And why we need sexual role models This concept that Dr. David Lay introduces around who do you look to as a sexual role model, which is difficult to do in this era where people don't talk openly about sex, how to find one and why we need them. Dr. David Lay is truly a man amongst men for speaking out about these topics in a way for many years where he was the only one doing so and now has some momentum behind his back. We owe him a debt of gratitude and I am grateful to be able to present this man amongst men to you. Dr. David Lay. Dr. Lay, you write a lot about this. And when I had a chance to see you at Esther Perel's Paradox of Masculinity, you mentioned that people who use profanity are oftentimes more honest than others. So I'm hoping that you're ready to deliver the goods today. Yeah, fucking A. Um, (laughs) I got all kinds of honesty for you. And it always sounds like a joke when I say it, but The research really is legitimate that people who suppress profanity are people who are a bit more focused on how their words are received and perceived and on not offending people. Certainly, I don't want to offend people, but I realized a few years ago that 
I can be more effective as a speaker and as a writer on these issues when I come across as a real person as opposed to a highbrow academic. And the more that I worked to kind of be a real person, to be a guy and engage with people and let them see me, not as Dr. Lay, but just as David, the more effective my message is. And so while I make the joke that, yeah, people who cuss more are more honest, there's some backstory behind that that I think is just an important part of my message in terms of not being ashamed of ourselves and, you know, not being ashamed of my, you know, potty mouth. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why I was so drawn to you is like, as soon as you took stage at Esther Perel's masculinity, Paradox of Masculinity, you do sound like a guy that I could go out and have a beer with. And in having spent four years in Sex Addicts Anonymous and going through so many different therapy sessions and hearing the clinical terms and everything seems so, I don't know, sanitary and sterilized. To have a conversation, to hear from someone who's just real is so refreshing. I think that's why one of the reasons why your message is so profound. Maybe it would be helpful for our listeners to get some general context around your background as a clinical psychologist, as an author. Where has your practice been? Where is it now and where are you taking it? Let me see. I got my... PhD in, in clinical psych back in, I think, 01 at University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. And I've mostly practiced in New Mexico and Texas. Uh, but early on in my career, I worked with sex offenders, adolescents and adults charged and convicted with sexual offenses. And I did that work for a while. And it's challenging work. And Slowly, I noticed that I was getting referrals from colleagues that were not offending behavior, but were just sex that was somewhat outside the norm, or at least whatever our colleagues think is the norm. And the challenge is that overwhelmingly therapists, 90 to 95 percent of, of mental health therapists in the United States, really have almost no training on healthy sexuality. They have no training on sexuality whatsoever. California is the only state in the country that requires mental health therapists to have any training on sexuality. And that really focuses just on kind of sexual diversity in terms of LGBT issues, which is important. But given that sexuality and that, you know, for instance, frequency of sex is one of the most robust predictors of life satisfaction you would think that therapists would be getting training on sexuality because sexuality issues are one of the things that bring people to individual therapy and certainly bring them to couples therapy. But unfortunately, probably about 30 years ago, therapists really stopped getting training on sexuality. And that happened as our society was going through a much more conservative period towards sexuality. AIDS crisis was happening and such. And all of a sudden, you know, heterosexual monogamy became the ideal. And now the world is changing, whether it's because of the internet, whether it's because of Fifty Shades of Grey, whether it's because of legalized gay marriage, on and on and on. Our society is becoming much more accepting of a wider swath of kind of sexual diversity. And so all of a sudden, all of these therapists out there who, like myself, really have no good training on sexuality are being confronted by sexuality issues that they're not prepared to manage. I am executive director of a very large nonprofit behavior health agency in Albuquerque. We're community mental health. I have about eh, a little under 100 staff, um, several locations we treat. Oh, about two to 3,000 patients a year, and it's traditional community mental health substance use treatment, serious mental illness, et cetera. But back in 07, 08, I was clinically depressed from banging my head against the wall with bureaucracy for the most part. And so I started collecting data for a study that I never actually published about people who were in consensual non-monogamous relationships. And Doing that, I ran across these couples who lived what they call the hot wife or the cuckold lifestyle. And this is 
you know, sexual practice. It's pretty popular these days. It's one of the most popular forms of porn on the internet now. But it's basically wives who are non-monogamous with their husband's enthusiastic kind of support, while the husband is usually monogamous except his wife, or only with his wife. And I'll be honest, when I ran into these couples, my initial reaction was, wow, that that's crazy. That can't be healthy. But then both of these couples were remarkably healthy. I mean, they had incredible communication skills, decades long marriages, successful kids, families, careers. And I was forced to confront that I had allowed a lot of social bias around female sexuality, promiscuity, monogamy to intrude into my clinical thinking without me noticing because. I really had very little training on sexuality except working with sex offenders and trying to come at these issues in a, in a kind of non-shaming, non-judgmental way. And so remember, I'm depressed and I'm kind of looking for a project that isn't going to get killed by bureaucracy. So I started interviewing these couples. This was back when Craigslist still had the personal section. And so when I travel for business, I would post ads on Craigslist, you know, looking for these couples. They would send me naked pictures of the wife, and I would say, thank you very much. You know, she's beautiful, but I'm really just interested in talking with you and understanding how you do this, how you make this work. At the end of it, I had a book. I had basically had to educate myself about all of the kind of sexual diversity, female sexuality issues, evolutionary psychology of sexuality and orgasm and monogamy and everything else, all of the stuff that I really should have been trained on. And because nothing had been published about these people, my book was had a contract within like six weeks. And, and I was sort of launched onto this career, um, basically a side career. I still run a very large business here in New Mexico. But I have this you know, really interesting kind of almost hobby now challenging the degree to which sexual morality and bias has really intruded into mental health and clinical practice. And I get to train therapists around the world about these issues, um, really confronting the degree to which they are often diagnosing and treating based on ignorance and their own limited experience and bias. You know, one of my favorite quotes is from Kinsey, who said the definition of a nymphomaniac or a sex addict in today's language is anybody who has more sex than the therapist. Right. That ended up being my second book called The Myth of Sex Addiction because I ended up really taking on the idea that sex addiction was a legitimate diagnosis and that sex addiction treatment was a legitimate kind of effective treatment. And, and what I argued in that book and what has really now kind of come true has really been demonstrated to be very, very true. The people who are struggling with what I call subjective self-control difficulties around sexuality, those people who feel like their sexual desires are out of control overwhelmingly are people who are struggling with a moral conflict over the sex that they want versus the sex they were taught was okay. Right. The neat thing is that the research is really supporting all of my arguments, which were that the sex addiction industry is really doing what I did, which is diagnosing from a very limited idea of what healthy sexuality is. And what we recognize now is that the scope of healthy sexuality is, is much broader. So along the way, I ended up recognizing and really realizing that male sexuality is the kind of expression or sexual expression that has been kind of thrown under the bus, testicles first where all of the symptoms of alleged sex addiction, whether it's, you know, promiscuity, whether it is masturbating, whether it is watching pornography, whether it's going to prostitutes, whether it is, you know, engaging in kinky sex or anonymous sex or casual sex. These are all behaviors that are engaged in by men much, much more than women. And I realized that we had characterized the idea of healthy sexuality based upon what women traditionally identify as healthy sex and what men pretend to identify as healthy sex mm -hmm. in order to make the women in their lives happy. Most sex addiction therapists are self-identified sex addicts. 
folks. They are people who got into the work because they identified as sex addicts, were struggling, got support from the idea of sex addiction. And so the 12th step is, you know, to spread the good word. And they really took that to heart. What that means, though, unfortunately, is that the only experience most of those folks have of sexuality is their own sexuality. They have very little training in sexual diversity, et cetera, and and other sorts of groups. And because I do, it was very, very clear to me that there are many, many gay men. There are swingers, for instance, and polyamorous folk who have way more sex than these sex addicts are having and are overwhelmed by guilt with And the swingers and the gay men have found a way to accommodate it, to integrate it in an ethical kind of conscious way in their lives. And I started realizing, you know, that's the problem. There's this neat research now, much of it coming from a researcher in in Ohio named Josh Grubbs, um, but he's really sparked this revolution in research where he's looking at the people who self-identify as being addicted to pornography or to sex. And as I said, they're finding that that self-identification is predicted predominantly by a history of religiosity, not by the amount of sex they're having or by sexual problems. What's even more interesting, though, is that people who identify as porn addicts, you would expect that if somebody feels like they can't control their use of pornography, that they would use more porn in the future than other people, right? Mm -hmm. But in fact, it turns out to not be the case that believing that you have less control of your sex or, or pornography behaviors has no predictive value for your future behaviors. What it does predict though, is that you're likely to feel shitty about yourself <laughs> anytime you feel sexual in the future. And What Grubbs really says and what the research is really saying is that this idea of sex or porn addiction has just become another label for sexual shame. And so now, once you identify as a sex or a porn addict, every time in the future that you have a sexual urge that doesn't match with the very limited idea of what you think healthy sexuality is, you're going to feel like, oh, there's my addiction. There I am being a bad person and being a sex addict and and losing control, as opposed to recognizing the fact that those sexual urges and thoughts are normal, are normative, and that we can be more effective at managing them and integrating them when we accept them and recognize them as a normal part of ourselves, as opposed to trying to force them to go away. Right. And I remember that you said that you're like taking a lesson from being a black belt in jujitsu. It's much more effective to redirect your opponent's energy than it is to resist and fight because then you make it stronger. And I, I definitely want to dive into that further, Dr. Lay. And one of the things that I think would be a really useful place for context setting is you've done so much work in the arena of pathology or prescribed pathology. Right? You're working with sex offenders or people who have maybe broken trust in their relationships or have been diagnosed as sex addicts. Given the men that are listening to this, who may not be in any of those categories, they're self-prescribed normal guys. They maybe are out single, having a a prolific sex life, or they're in a relationship where they're committed and maybe are feeling some of the tensions of being in that monogamous construct. I'd be curious to get your perspective on why should they, be thinking about this stuff much more deeply and what lessons can they learn from you who have been to the fringes and learned what you've learned and now you can bring that back to let's say the uh the the fat of the bell curve who don't feel like they have any problems probably don't have any problems but like definitely haven't done any introspection around how their sexual behaviors could either be contributing to a great life or maybe a, an underwhelming one The folks who end up getting called sex addicts are a couple of different groups. One is, as I said, they're they're folks who grew up religious. They're also folks who got abstinence-only education, as most of us did. So they really don't have that kind of broader understanding of their sexuality. Even the people who are not getting in trouble for sex, one of the things that's interesting is that 
we only really think about our sexuality when we're turned on. We don't think about what it means, maybe, that we find certain kinds of images or pornography or certain kinds of fantasies arousing. We don't think about that stuff except when we're turned on. And so one of the things I encourage folks to do is think about your sexuality. Think about your erotic kind of interest and needs and how they are a part of your life. Because most of us kind of try and keep our sexuality in a box. It is usually the case in today's world that we only hear about male sexuality when they're in trouble. We hear a lot about Donald Trump's sexuality, but we heard absolutely nothing about President Obama's sexuality. We heard about Bill Clinton's sexuality when he got in trouble. We don't think about what, you know, ethical, responsible kind of sexuality is. And so we just kind of go along until, unfortunately, we run into trouble. And in today's environment with the Me Too movement, et cetera, we are now, many of us as men are being confronted by sexuality that had been fine for a long time. But all of a sudden, we're being challenged and told that was inappropriate, that was selfish, that was harassment of one kind or another. And particularly powerful, wealthy men who have for many, many years gotten away with a lot of sexual freedom and privilege that is kind of gone now. And now those guys have to spend some time thinking about this stuff. And so one of the things that I say to to young men If you have learned about sexuality from pornography, which is the case for many people because we're not getting good sex education, then one of the things that you might think is that it's perfectly fine to, you know, ejaculate on a girl's face because there's lots of that in pornography. So, of course, you're going to do it. But what I tell guys is don't come on a girl's face unless you can be a gentleman while you do so. And they kind of look at me like, what? This is a different approach because... Most modern anti-porn folks, you know, Gil Dines and a lot of others, they view the facial ejaculation in pornography as a sign of, you know, male dominance and as a sign of misogyny and just everything else. And they are of the opinion that guys who find that sexy are awful men. Mm -hmm. And so what they would really like is to make that go away. And they tell guys, if you like that, then you're a bad guy. I tell guys, it's fine for you to like it, but you have to be a gentleman while you do that. Now, can you be a gentleman coming on a girl's face? Yeah, you can if you have talked to her about it in advance, if you know that she likes it, if it involves consent and mutuality, if she enjoys it and you enjoy it and you understand and have accepted why you enjoy it. We don't think about, you know, being gentlemanly in our sexual behavior. You know, can you be a gentleman while you spank somebody? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And what you're getting at is that there's some, like men have these desires that they've been told are wrong, whether it's ejaculating on a woman's face or pulling her hair or smacking Mm -hmm. her ass. And so they say, let's, let's say with their partner, I can't do that with her. Or they don't even know that they can bring up the conversation. They don't know how to. And what ends up happening is they go to the subterranean world, which is, well, I'll just go to porn over here because then I can get that done. I, I don't have to face rejection. I don't have to have the difficult conversation or piss her off potentially. The conversation never even happens. So like, what I think I hear you saying is that if men can learn that there is a place for their desires to embrace that and, and to actually like start to understand it by thinking about it when they're not turned on. It's it's maybe understanding where that need comes from and then being able to hold the space in in a conversation with your partner where that can become something that they may turn her on exceptionally if she feels that it's coming from a place where there is mutual consent and respect for one another. Absolutely. You know, one of my favorite stories is a guy that I worked with who, you know, been referred to me as a porn addict and he'd gotten caught looking at porn at work and was in trouble for it. 
Men have a, unfortunately, very limited range of coping skills to deal with negative emotions. Um, <laughs> Fair. Men, you know, men use sex and drinking and suppression as the way to deal with feelings of anxiety or depression. And women are taught from an early age to express negative emotions much more effectively and to develop new ways to cope or deal with them. Men are not. We're just kind of taught to suck it up, right? And so a lot of the guys that I see are guys who masturbation and sex is a really awesome way to turn off the worry and the sadness in your brain. Uh Um, The problem is that if you're at work or if you're at church, you need some other strategies. (laughs) And so You know, when I see these guys like this guy who was working in a really boring job, he was really depressed and was a really bright, bright guy, but he wasn't understanding how to pay attention to his feelings. And so he's sitting at work and he's bored and, you know, porn is never more than a couple of clicks away. So all of a sudden he would just kind of find himself looking at porn at work and now he's in trouble. So one of the things that we did was focusing on helping him to develop other coping strategies, you know, to be more mindful and aware of his sexuality and his behavior. You know, I mean, literally, I got him to install, you know, Sudoku games on his phone and to play those instead of looking at porn um, on his work computer when he was bored. And one of the other harm reduction strategies I tell these guys is I'm not telling you stop watching porn, but what if we make a rule that the only place you can watch porn is on your phone because it reduces the chances then you're going to get in work trouble for it rather than trying to suppress and stop a behavior. Let's try and shape the behavior. Let's redirect it into a healthier kind of safer way. So we're doing all these strategies and frankly, they're working and things are going better. But I also asked him, dude, what kind of porn are you watching? He's watching um, urophilia porn, porn with water sports, with people urinating and such. Uh And it turns out this was a big fetish for him. But I asked him, does your wife know about this? And he goes, no. And he was just deathly afraid that his wife would think he was a pervert and and sick for having these interests. And I said, you know, you've been married for 12 years. You're losing your job now over this. Maybe it's time to talk with your wife about this interest. And so, I mean, the poor guy was terrified. But we did role play for a couple of weeks about how he could go home and talk to his wife about this interest and answer any questions for her, et cetera, et cetera. He came back and he was so excited. He was sitting on the edge of his seat bouncing up and down because it turns out his wife was into it. It wasn't like a big fetish for her like it was for him, but she was good giving and game, as Dan Savage says. She was willing to accommodate and make that part of their life. And so after that, about once a week, she would pee, he would watch her, and they'd jump in bed and have crazy hot sex. Now, he no longer had the need to watch this porn in secret, which had ruined his life. Right. Because he had found a way to negotiate and accommodate and accept it and view it as a part of himself as opposed to this awful thing that he needed to not think about and try and cut away. One of the stories that goes the other way that I think most men fear is something that I witnessed maybe over a decade ago. I was in a hotel room. I was in a hotel in Philadelphia. I come off the elevator bank and I'm walking all the way down to the other end of the hallway, which is where my hotel room is. And I can hear a woman screaming at who, someone who must be her husband in the bedroom because she had just discovered his porn stash on his computer, which uh, clearly wasn't discussed, right? Like this, this is like, you know, many men's worst nightmare. And she is eviscerating him. Like, how could you find these fucking women attractive? You're disgusting. If you like them, how could you like me say something for yourself? And then he would like speak up and start sputtering. And she's like, shut the fuck up and like overrun him was just this moment where I know that she felt betrayed. So there was some compassion there for her. I could feel like on the other side of it, this man who obviously there was guilt and shame and feeling like he couldn't present. And there is that reality. The partner may not be as accepting. And what do we do in those situations where we know that that's, that is a potential? There's a lot in that issue. and, And it is a big issue and a very common one that, you know, we're not talking about. 
There's this research by a researcher named Negi, N-E-G-Y. He compared Americans and Europeans, and he showed that Americans were much more likely to view watching porn as a form of infidelity Mm. than Europeans. But he also showed that in the Americans, having low self-esteem and being religious were predictive factors for viewing pornography use as infidelity when those things weren't true in the European population. I reached out to the author and I asked him about his findings. And he said, Europeans just don't take sex and religion as seriously as Americans do. We view infidelity as, you know, something that we don't really want to happen, but it's not this huge rock bottom, absolute defining moral failing. Mm. That kind of stood out to me. And now I am not saying that women who think their husbands are cheating when they watch porn have low self-esteem or are just religious, you know, lunatics that need to get life. What I'm saying is that we haven't really acknowledged or understood the fears that are behind those women's beliefs. And that is what can help, but it's a hard conversation. I tell guys, if you are watching porn and masturbating, most porn use involves masturbation. And so when we talk about porn use or porn problems, we're actually talking about masturbation. And most arguments against pornography are actually anti-masturbation arguments. And so one of the things that is clear is that women and men masturbate differently. Women and men use masturbation differently within marriages. Women masturbate more when they are having more sex, but men masturbate more when they are having less sex and they masturbate less when they're having more sex because men use masturbation to porn as a way to compensate for decreased sex or for sexual dissatisfaction. That's where this really comes up, is that men are using masturbation to porn when they feel sexually unsatisfied within their relationships, and they're not really able to negotiate that. Unfortunately, what's happened today is that the person who wants sex least controls the frequency of sex within the marriage. And we don't teach people how to negotiate around sexual accommodation. You know, if I want to go golfing and my wife hates golf, she's still likely to willing to to negotiate going and staying at a golf resort so I can go golf. But if I really love kinky sex or I really love swinging, she is far less likely to be willing to accommodate or negotiate that within relationship because We treat sex inherently as a uniquely special behavior, and that is a moral issue. It is oftentimes a religious issue. I believe sex is special, but as a clinical psychologist, I have to look at it as a behavior like any others. What I end up doing is trying to help couples and men discuss and negotiate and identify What's going on when she is, you know, shouting at him and saying, how can you find those women attractive? Is she really saying, well, do you not find me attractive anymore? And is that why this is happening? And is there something wrong with me? And is this the end of our marriage and everything else? And now we can start talking about those fears. And we can also start talking about the fact that, well, you know, wife, sometimes you masturbate in the bathtub, or sometimes you watch romantic movies and get turned on, or sometimes you're reading romance novels to explore the idea of kind of intimacy or sexuality that isn't present in your life. And that's what men use porn for too. Porn is, one husband told me after reading my book, he said, my God, I realized that porn for me is the same thing as my wife's vibrator is for her. But we've been taught as men not to shame the wife now for using a vibrator to have an orgasm. But there is still this deep-seated fear that if a man gets off to porn, that he's not going to want to or be able to get off to his wife. One of the biggest questions that we get when we run our monthly events in New York City, uh, it's called the discerning dick sexual wisdom for the modern man. One of the biggest questions. Yeah, I figured you would appreciate that. (laughs) 
is from men who are in long-term relationships or married, when I watch porn, is that cheating? And so Mm -hmm. I suppose the question is, and you brought this up before, it's why is that perceived as like the man feeling that way? And why might a woman experience it in that way where you're saying some other cultures, it's just, it's not even an issue. A lot of it goes back to kind of, you know, the morality that we're taught about sex. And we're also taught this Disney myth. When you meet the right person, the one, you'll be in love, you'll have great sex, even though you've never had sex before and you've never had any sex education, and you'll never ever want anybody else. You'll never even find other people attractive once you've got the one. And that works for some people, for a relatively few amount of people. But we've created that as the ideal. And so now anybody who struggles with any of that is seen as deficient. And we're not accepting or understanding, you know, the... The diversity in, for instance, libido, the diversity in terms of sexual sensation seeking, we're also not taking into account the fact that for many men, you know, novelty is a really significant part of sexual arousal. And that's something that pornography gives us. It gives us a lot of novelty when we're in a relationship where there may not be novelty. To dive in, sorry, sorry, Dr. Lee, for interrupting, but like to dive in on that and to combine it with another thought that you had before about this need for novelty and also to negotiate some of these desires. One of the things that we hear from women quite a bit, so the, the women come to our events as well, and they say, when guys start to have these conversations with us, it almost feels like they're imposing this on us. It's like, I'm expected now to dress up in this slutty way. I'm expected to let you come on my face, even when I'm opposed to that. I think what we're seeing is a disconnect in while expressing your own needs as a man, also considering hers. And that's right. Do you often see that break down during those initial conversations? And if so, are there a couple of tips that you can offer men? And I know you do this in your book around like how to bring her into porn, ethical porn for dicks. Are there ways, tips you can offer men to, to like start that conversation so she feels included versus a pressure? Being a good listener has gotten me laid way more than being a good talker. I have had the best sex of my life because I could listen to people. I really think we have to start there and you have to listen effectively. You know, I really like, what do they call it? Steel manning arguments where instead of taking on a straw man of someone's argument, you try to present to them, this is how I understand your perspective. And you do so as accurately and strongly as you can so that you show you really get the strength and foundation of their argument. And you're trying to understand it, not dismantle it. Mm. If guys can do that with their female partners so that instead of shaming their girlfriend or partner for, you know, for having these fears, they acknowledge and recognize and even honor their partner's fears. That is one of the ways that it creates safety and it creates more security and it creates more willingness of those partners to now explore some of the boundaries of it. Um, you know, I gave a talk in, in Utah on um, uh, porn addiction. You're and, welcome in and, Utah after all the things that uh, you said about yeah, Utah. <laughs> well, you, you know, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was a little bit nervous. When I did the talk, I was completely coated in butter underneath my clothes because I was told that's the best way to get tar and feathers off. I was just sure, you know, I was going to be ridden out of the state on a rail. But I worked really, really hard to acknowledge this very large group of Mormons, to acknowledge and say they're not stupid for being afraid of pornography, but to give them credit for, yeah, pornography today represents different sexual values than you were taught are okay. So, of course, you're going to have strong reactions to this, and it's going to feel very frightening, and it's going to feel like it's changing the world. And as I was able to honor and recognize and not shame them for feeling differently about sex than I do, now we could have a real conversation. And one of the things they said to me was, 
David, we don't have words to talk about this stuff the way you do. They said, you talk about responsible sexuality. You talk about ethical porn. You talk about sexual integrity. And we're just taught not to think about it and Mm. not talk about it. And so I started recognizing that the language that we can try and find that integrates ethics and responsibility is one of the ways where we can we can meet in the middle with people who don't have the same level of comfort with sexuality that we do. On airplanes, I usually don't tell people that I'm a therapist or, God forbid, a sex therapist because, you know, then I'm trapped next to them for hours as they're kind of wanting free therapy. But when I do, I usually get two responses. One is, oh, you could write a paper about me or about us. Or I get this kind of look of nervous fear where people are concerned that I have x-ray vision and I can see the secrets that they're having from everybody else. Can't you though? Can't you kind of? Oh, absolutely. (laughs) That's the fun part. part. But but the thing is, everybody has those secrets and everybody is convinced that they're the only one. Bingo. Yeah. There's this study that was done in in Canada um, back in uh, 2016 by a researcher named Christian Joyal, and he did a population-based study with a non-clinical sample where they did phone calls, and then they also did email kind of tests to, to validate it with random people in Quebec, and they asked about these random people's interest in and participation in various kinds of kinky sex, whether it's exhibitionism or voyeurism or sadism or masochism, bondage, discipline, yada, yada, yada. And these are things that we were taught, we are all taught, are very rare. And that if you have those things, there's probably something wrong with you, that that's not normal sexuality. But in this research, they actually found out that 50% of the random population had one or more of these kinky sex fantasies. 30% of them had engaged in those behaviors. And that interest in sexual masochism, for instance, was really strongly correlated with life satisfaction in general. Why is that? So we are, well, it may be about being able to kind of give up the attempt to be in control of everything. Hmm. It may also be about um, this is a way to cope with some of the stress and anxiety of life, on and on and on. We, we kind of don't know why sexual masochism may be somewhat healthy, but look at the popularity of Fifty Shades of Grey. I mean, it sold 100 million copies. Right. Because there are a lot of people, predominantly women out there, who have that interest, but they keep their mouth shut because if they thought before the popularity of the book, if they shared it with anybody, especially a therapist, that we would think there's something wrong with them. Right. It turns out that you know half the population or more have these kinky sexual interests and are keeping it quiet because they don't want to be judged in shame. And the more we can acknowledge that, I think the greater kind of sexual acceptance we can find in other people and in ourselves, you know, helping guys recognize, well, if you've got this kind of kinky sexual interest, you know, guess what, by the chances are really good. The girl you're trying to have sex with or the girl you're married to, they have a kinky sexual interest, too, that they've never shared with you. Let's put them both on the table. Let's start talking about how this stuff matches up and how we can achieve happiness and satisfaction through mutual accommodation. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's it's so interesting as you say that I was running a men's group here in my apartment once and some of the men were married and one of the coaches who was in here also facilitating, he asked the question, do you know how your wife likes to be fucked? And all the guys in the room were like, oh yeah, sure. And then he goes, do you? And then all of them were like, I don't really know. They've never gotten behind the hood about what is her fantasies. And many of the guys in the room admitted that they would be intimidated or insecure about knowing because it may be, it could be that she would want another man. It could be that she would want to be dominated and he's not a dominant man. It could be that she wants a guy with a bigger dick and like he doesn't have one. And it creates these moments where, okay, like we understand their emotions. The bottom line is 
not bringing that out into the center, not having that conversation is where some of this stuff goes underground and like weird shit starts right. up. Where I'd love to finish this conversation is around this question you were asking at the paradox of masculinity that I really feel was illuminating. It's about who is your sexual role model? And you asked this question, yeah. you know, a number of different times and ways, and you got some really like shitty answers, I thought, because like, I think that most people hadn't ever thought about it. And even hearing you talk about how 50% of people had some of these kinky fantasies that they'd never shared, but then all of a sudden Shades of Grey comes out and then all of a sudden everyone feels liberated because there's an example out there. So people do have sexual role models. They just don't know it. They haven't consciously defined who that sexual role model is. And I'm just curious, after you've been asking that question for a while now, what lessons can you teach us about A, why we need a sexual role model? What benefits can they provide? And how do we go about identifying them? It is a question that I ask a lot, and there are still not a lot of good answers. And I think part of the message, part of the answer is that we're still not talking about what healthy sex is as opposed to the limited idea of moral sex. There have been some kind of interesting ones lately, though. For instance, Jeff Bezos, when you know he is blackmailed for sending naked pictures, rather than succumbing and giving in to the fear and shame of having sent naked pictures, he calls their bluff hmm. and basically says, everybody has this secret fear and I'm not going to give in to that shame anymore. Hmm. Um, that I think is one of the places where we're starting to see some new message and it is about, you know, for me, I think the healthiest kind of sexual role model is one that incorporates both, you know, responsible, conscious, mindful sexuality and recognizes and resists the power of shame. Unfortunately, religion and the sex addiction world and lots of modern kind of approaches to sexuality, you know, even in the Me Too movement right now, there is all this shame. There's all this shame towards people who engage in or feel the desire for some kind of sex that somebody else has decided they shouldn't have or want. Yeah. And you should be ashamed of that. Well, unfortunately, shame just drives that behavior underground. It makes it harder to think about consciously and take responsibility for. And it may actually paradoxically increase the strength of it. And it may make it more taboo and even more exciting. So I think the more that we can help people to recognize how shame is something that is used to control them and their sexuality and that it doesn't work and that we need different kind of role models, whether it's like Jeff Bezos or, you know, there was this Australian singer named Sia, S-I-A-A, S-I-A, I forget her name. Yeah. Somebody was shopping around naked pictures of her that they were going to sell in the tabloids, and she found out about it, and she was like, well, fuck you. And so she posted some naked pictures on Twitter and just took away, just took away the market. That is new, and we're seeing that now as more and more people are acknowledging that 50% thing. More and more people are acknowledging, hey, I know everybody is pretending that they're not a pervert, but we all are. Yeah, I, I did what you said about recognizing and resisting the power of shame is enormous. And those two examples of Sia and Jeff Bezos and you emphasizing the fact that that's new is a really hopeful place that we're entering now where some of the pillars, right, the people that we look up to, the people who are most in the spotlight are saying, fuck this. I shouldn't be ashamed of my sexuality. This is actually something we should celebrate. And the fact that people are profiting off of something that's supposedly beautiful, that is beautiful, that represents a turning point. So I'm going to do some deep thing. You know, Will Smith and Jada Pinkett were people who came <laughs> to my mind, you know, because they're very prominent and they're also very mainstream. For them to open up, and Jada's talked about like some of her compulsive sexual behaviors, and I think they've both spoken about their non-traditional open relationships without mm -hmm. shame, and they haven't become any less beloved as a result of it, right? 
that is also a big turning point that they haven't been marginalized for it. So we're starting to see some really hopeful signs, I would say. And Jada, when she talked about, you know, her sexuality, and she even said, for a while, I kind of thought I was a sex addict, because I thought I could get all of my needs met through sex. Well, I think that is a deep, deep insight. But let's be clear, that is not an addiction or a disease. That is something that happens to people who have not been taught how to understand and integrate their sexuality and are hiding from it and ashamed of it. And I think that the really powerful thing about both of them is the degree to which they have successfully resisted that shame to be monogamous or to be non-sexual, this, that, or the other thing. And I agree with you. I think it's powerful. One of the other folks that I talk about is Ruby and Ossie Davis, you know, the African-American singers and actors. And it came out after their death that they had had like a 10 or 15 year period of their 50 year long marriage where they were non-monogamous. And they even said, there was a quote of them saying, we realized and decided that it was more ethical for us to acknowledge and take responsibility for the temptation to cheat than to pretend it wasn't happening. Mm. Mm. And that is at the core of everything that you talk about, which is this, if you try to resist what comes up and you suppress what comes up and you label it and then the guilt and shame spiral starts, that's where the real power of that thing starts to kick in. And you can yep. maybe avoid it for a while, but it's going to pop up in some way, shape or form. Absolutely. And, and unfortunately, there are people out there who want you in that spiral because they can manipulate you and exploit you and take advantage of you when you're in that place. I mean, I, I refer to the modern media as the anxiety industry because their job is to make you nervous and then sell you shit. Yeah. 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 Well, this has been super, super helpful and, and, and very insightful as always, Dr. Lay. And the, your three books, Insatiable Wives, The Myth of Sex Addiction, Ethical Porn for Dicks. Yep. And where else can they find you if you want to be found? Twitter is one of the best and easiest ways to reach me. And it's at Dr. David Lay. Last name is L-E-Y. I'm really present on that platform. Part of a lot of really interesting conversations about a lot of this stuff. I'm really interested in seeing where all of these things go. I'm really happy that, you know, the, I got to do that talk at Esther's conference. And I'm really happy that folks like you are doing podcasts and these monthly gatherings like you are, because that's how we move the ball down the field in a responsible and ethical, non-shaming way saying, yeah, sex is a wonderful thing and we're not going to be ashamed of that anymore. As a final salute to the work that you're doing and even asking some of these newer questions like where do I find ethical porn or how do I reduce guilt and shame around this? I feel like these are newer questions for me, but then seeing that you've been in this work for over a decade and you've written the books on these things in spaces that didn't have books before, that needed a voice, especially to speak out when there's no one really on your side to do that for so long and to still continue to get stronger so that those of us could eventually find you, us laggards, so that we can move the ball down the field. We owe you a tribute and a thanks for the work that you're doing so that we can become smarter and also help to spread the word. So Dr. Lay, thank you for that. And also thank you for sharing your wisdom on the Man Amongst Men podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. This has been a lot of fun. I really enjoyed the conversation, Dominic. Hey, thanks for listening to the Man Amongst Men podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you want more access to tools and resources and you want information on our upcoming live events and retreats, head on over to www.doinnerwork.com. 